Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're uh, into our second part of a two-part series with Agenda Health, a leading global health organization committing to advancing gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights with our very special guests, Sakai Chikorero, Vice President of Programs, Anna Temba, Technical Director and Deputy Country Representative of the Gender of Health in Tanzania, Dawood Alam, Senior Specialist and Social and Behavior Change Communications Leader at Agenda Health in India, and Meskarem Setenya, SRHR Project Director at Engender Health in Ethiopia. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry if if I was inaccurate in the rendering of your names. I, I really appreciate your, your patience with me, and I'm so happy to have you all here today. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Every, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank everybody's you. coming in from all sorts of different parts of the world. So we're going to go to you, Sakai, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, Engender Health's overarching mission, and then talk about how you put together a team that is able to lead that mission within the context of the different countries, the different uh, groupings, the different regions uh, that you have. And then we'll go around the table and talk a little bit about everyone's background. Sakai, uh, talk a little bit about what Engender Health is about. Thank you. At Engender Health, we are a sexual reproductive health and rights organization, and we use gender equality as our North Star to the work that we do in the three impact areas that um, uh, make up our mandate. That is uh, SRHR, uh, maternal health, and gender-based violence. Uh, as we discussed earlier in the week, uh, in our organization, we apply an intersectional inclusive lens to ensure our programming is equitable and addresses the needs of marginalized and underserved communities. And gender health takes a holistic approach to gender equality, uh, focused on high quality integrated programming that meets the most pressing needs of women and girls in all their diversity, including um, uh, the GBV that I mentioned and the maternal health that I mentioned. It includes uh, the intersection of uh, technical areas in the health sector and other critical global uh, issues uh, that ensures that the most underserved and marginalized are not only included, but are meaningfully engaged in the design and implementation of the activities that are targeting their vulnerabilities. And this includes people living with disabilities, uh, women affected by fistula, uh, adolescents, and youth, uh, giving them uh, access to contraception. Today, uh, you are going to hear from my colleagues uh, sharing a bit more in depth about the work that we do, uh, picking just three examples, Tanzania, India, and Ethiopia. That's great. And Anna, let's, let's come to you. How did you end up joining this organization, and what is your background? So I'm a medical doctor and a public health specialist. So um, I've been in this field for over 13 years now. And throughout my career journey, really, um, I've been around um, SRHR. So spanning from maternal health program um, and also integrated program around family planning, gender, um, HIV, TB, um, et cetera. And so how did I end here? <laughs> um, I think... Starting way back um, in my university life, um, I think I made that call. Um, specifically, I was more like, you know, interested when um, in the first and the second year, when we used to do a lot of community work. Um, so I started seeing di um, things differently. You know, when you start medical school, you always think about hospitals and all. Then we st when we start with community work, I realized, okay, maybe this is the game changer. And then that transitioned um, as I now moved to my internship. So I was, I did my internship in a poor, relatively poor urban area. And um, I really saw the ends were not meeting. <laughs> we are here working in a hospital very hard, but then we are flooded, you know, our uh, human resource is not enough and people are coming in over and over and we're just not able to meet. And even the resources that we had were not enough. So, you know, I started thinking like, you know, public health is the way to go. But again, which area in the public health? 
You know, so for all that to meet, people also need to have a healthy reproductive health. So that's also how I ventured now in the sexual reproductive health, seeing like, you know, people can plan their families better, you know, people can space, people can access services, people are also empowered you know, to demand for services, because again, you know, most of these public health um, problems are also coming from, you know, in need, uh, personal agency to seek and demand services. So that's also how I ended up up in here. Thanks. Well, that's really fascinating. So you come from a hospital environment, you say, well, wait a second, there's an upstream issue that yeah. causes this flood of individuals. So let's deal with, with the upstream the uh, issue. Yes. Uh, what, um, how, how did you get involved and what was your background? Yeah, uh, currently I'm uh, working as an associate director, uh, social and behavior change communication. Uh, I've got a got an interesting story. Actually, I started my career by selling condom in a social marketing organization. At that time, my responsibility was to change behavior of those high-risk adult males. Uh, like uh, to prevent uh, HIV. So, uh, but now, now uh, with engineer health, uh, I'm focusing on changing providers' behavior mostly. So this is what my journey is. Quite uh, interesting journey. Uh, uh, my, I have done my uh, uh, masters in uh, social work uh, here at uh, uh, University of Delhi, and uh, uh, like over the uh, over the two decades of my experience. Uh, I have been working client facing as well as providing provider facing communication. You know that's fascinating. So you have a, di a totally different um, uh, entree in, into this. Um, one from sort of a hospital side. The other is from sort of the the um, the provision of of contraceptive. Maskaram, how did you um, uh, uh, come into this this field? So thank you. Uh, I'm uh, a midwife by profession, and uh, I'll... can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a midwife by profession and a public health professional, uh, and I've been working in this field uh, for almost ten years uh, now. Uh, I've been working as a direct service provider for maternal and child health in uh, one of in governmental health facilities and that's where i meet uh the, my current organization in gender health as i i was a provider as well as a trainer for sexual and reproductive health and i wanted like to uh, push my career from this direct service provider level to health uh, system strengthening and uh, technical leadership level. Uh, that's why I joined this organization and I'm currently working as a project director for our rights-based approach projects uh, uh, to enhance SRHR here at the Gender Health Ethiopia. And currently I'm working with uh, directly with young people, women, uh, youth-led and women-led organizations uh, so, so that we can like improve uh, the SRHR uh, in the communities and areas that we are currently working in. Uh, Ms. Karam, uh, forgive my my ignorance about the operating circumstances of midwives uh, in uh, Ethiopia. Um, in terms of of how midwives function, um, my my understanding is that there are uh, some midwives who primarily work through facilities, through, through clinics and hospital facilities, and some that primarily work in the home. Um, do, did, you, did you primarily work through facilities or through uh, home care? Uh, facilities, health, uh, health centers and uh, hospitals. We also work with uh, community health workers, which we call health extension worker in Ethiopian context. So we have to go for a community dialogue and house to house visits uh, for immunization, for child health and uh, maternal health as well. So it's more of uh, facility based, but we are expected also like to collaborate with the community health workers uh, to provide some technical support. What I think is so interesting is the knowledge here that is contributed, both in terms of community understanding, but also systems understanding. Anna, you were talking about, you know, being associated with a hospital system. Dawood, it, it, it looks to me like, like you also have that same as Meskarem has this, this understanding of systems. 
Could you talk a little bit about the importance of understanding how systems work on the ground so that when you're bringing your expertise to an organization that is coordinated by Sakai, that that expertise informs the overarching uh, programs that are being shaped for delivery locally. Anna, do you want to do you want to start uh, with this, and then we'll go around the table yeah. again? Yeah, I think it's important, you know, to first understand the context because contexts are different. So Tanzanian context may also be very different. Yeah, some things might be similar, but there are a lot of things that are different. So, for example, um, I'm taking this call from Dodoma, the capital city of um, Tanzania, attending a primary health care conference. So in this conference, we've had data from Tanzania, both Ministry of Health and Ministry of President's Office and um, Regional Administration that is not published so, you know, if you're not um, on the ground and hearing these things from people, from the ministry themselves, um, or people who are actually doing this work day to day, you might not be able to know what is going on, what are the priorities and what are the challenges, because they are also limited on how much we share out there, um, you know, in terms of publication, and also how much we sit and discuss as country team, you know, um, to learn our way forward, and, and also how we are navigating our own challenges. But also, um, you know, being here, again, there are differences even across regions, but, you know, being here on the ground, we're able to navigate and also um, expand our, our scope across regions. And we get now to learn the grassroots um, drivers. So we might have uh, had a challenge last year, but, you know, through implementation, things have changed and things are quickly adapting. Maybe a new challenge has emerged, new priorities have emerged. Then we are able to gather those lessons um, compile them and then come and adapt on how we program. So I think also that's one of the benefit. Again, you know, um, through this journey, now I've said like, you know, start back in my um, internship years, the same place if you go there today, um, things have changed. Um, maybe it has moved from being that poor urban area to now being a very urban, different priorities, different changes and new things emerge. So I think that's also another importance. Um, of getting this context specific um, expertise. But also, you know, we sit here and we are also, we are employed by Engender Health, but we sit in various technical working groups and, and different where, you know, also donors come and share priorities and also, you know, share our expertise um, from Engender Health to other people. So also, you know, people adapt that way because um, people say, feel safe. Uh, and even the ministry feel, you know, you are a trusted partner, you are from the same place, you've seen the challenges, you adapt, you take those global lessons, you adapt accordingly. So it also increases the likelihood of that change to be adapted rather than if someone else coming from a very different context, they might not be listening because they think maybe you don't understand the context, but if you are, you know, from the same area, you understand, then that is taken differently. And Dawood, you're, you're working within a, a huge, huge country with so many different cultures, so many different languages. Talk a little bit about how your expertise has helped to navigate the complexity that is India. So I will start with the, like, with the uh, health system part. Uh, the, we see the system in three different levels. Uh, first is like the, the community or individual level, and then the facility or health system level, and as well as policy and pro, uh, policy level uh, system. So uh, first and foremost thing is the, my job is to understand these systems and how in, these interact with each other. So uh, in order to simplify the complexity, uh, then uh, mostly uh, like we start from the individual who is our actually the audience, the main audience. And then, uh, so, and then in in terms of like you know, what are uh, what are the different uh, enablers or factors uh, that will uh, help them to satisfy their demand at individual level, and the accordingly we work with the facility or uh, individual uh, facility or provider level, and then how these demands are met by the providers. So the, the this is again some of the insights we'll have. And what are the, the changes required in the policy level? Uh, then this understanding also we have. And accordingly, we design our program and our interventions are also uh, like, laid out uh, depending on the insights we have at different levels. 
Of the so you see your 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 role as triangulating amongst these different parties, and and try and coordinate provision, but but um, a lot of your work is done through third parties. Is, if I'm understanding you correctly. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have our partners, and these partners are actually the long-term partner, meaning like throughout the project, as well as short-term partners as well. So, and, and then by doing uh, involving these partners, we also ensure the uh, cost-effectiveness part of our uh, intervention. Interesting, interesting. Ms. Karam, um, again, uh, just sort of coming back to, to how you work, uh, across uh, Ethiopia, again, a very, very heterogeneous society with so many different li- linguistic groups and so much, uh, so many different types of needs. How do you ensure that you are providing the appropriate um, response to individual communities? Um, and how do you adjust? I mean, that must be part of the art of the midwife, right? Because you have to adjust on the fly because each birth is different, right? True. That's true. Uh, Ethiopia is a very complex uh, country and uh, currently our programs work uh, both in development and humanitarian setting because of like the current challenges that uh, we are uh, to like to strengthen the systems currently we use different approaches one with uh, like we hire local staffs in the regions that uh, we are currently working with so this will help us like uh, these uh, staffs will understand like, like the local context including the language uh, the community speaks so it will be easier for them to connect with the communities including the partners uh, and government level uh, uh, stakeholders that we are currently working with uh, and it will give them the opportunities to understand the current challenges and gaps uh, that exist in the areas that we work with. I think having a local staff and ensuring that uh, we have uh, uh, communication with the government uh, sector so that we can identify the priorities of the government and the community is also helping us to identify uh, the, our interventions and our strategies as well uh, and to formulate like a locally led programming uh, as well as like building trust in different communities that uh, we are working with. So we do uh, hire staffs locally. Uh, we work uh, closely with the governments through uh, technical working groups and other task forces so that we can align our plan, our priorities, and uh, we can also share like evidence-based uh, learnings that we have from different countries uh, that Engender Health work, works with. You know, it strikes me, Sakai, that in order to actually make this all work, um, a real sensitivity to how power and communication functions is, is so critically important because if you make the wrong assumption, the whole thing falls apart, right? So you almost have to create little nuggets of value that your people, whether it's Ana, Meskrem, uh, Dawood, or others, can configure for local need, right? But, but small little nuggets so that when Anna does something or Dawood does something or Meskarem does something that, you know, Meskarem can look at a micro community and say, okay, these little elements are the right elements here. Right, Anna? And and then and then Dawood, um, you know, these elements are the right elements here. Sakai, how do you how do you ensure that you're able to deliver uh, small enough elements that are practical and reproducible, but then also give each of your country leaders the flexibility to configure those solutions in a way that makes sense for them and for their micro communities uh, within within their context. So what you're highlighting actually touches on uh, some of the challenges that we manage on the ground and this is to do this to do with uh, the coordination and collaboration that our teams have to do and engage in with other teams from other organizations, with the government, and with the communities that we serve. 
within the health sector itself, but also across sectors. You would find that collaboration uh, is very essential and is required for SRHR programming to be successful. Uh, it is a challenge in the sense that sometimes uh, different projects have different priorities or they have different mandates and the organizational cultures are different. But within Engender Health, we remind ourselves that in order to be successful as anything that we are uh, trying to do, we have to build strong partnerships uh, with other stakeholders that are working in the same communities and pursuing the same goals as ourselves. Uh, it fosters effective communication when you uh, rally behind the challenge as a team in partnership with other uh, stakeholders. And it is uh, critical in, in, in overcoming some of the challenges that have to do with fragmented services, for example. Uh, SRHR itself often cuts across multiple sectors beyond health. It includes education when we are working with uh, adolescents and youth. It includes social welfare when we are dealing with uh, uh, the challenges that affect um, uh, disadvantaged communities. So coordinating our efforts uh, ensures seamless integration of services across sectors and within the health sector itself. Uh, if there is fragmentation, it leads to gaps in service delivery and it hinders comprehensive uh, care. So that communication uh, at programmatic level, at policy level, and at community level uh, ensures a cohesive approach to saving the people that we uh, work with. I'm really curious about something. You know, we do executive search for nonprofits like in gender, but we're in it not because it optimizes our own income. If we want to optimize our own income, we would work for commercial organizations. We're in it because we really feel that if this is done right, we can improve civil society using our skills. So when you look at uh, India or Ethiopia or, uh, or uh, Tanzania, do you feel like you're improving your, your societies, your countries? Let's start with uh, Meskarem, and then we'll go to the wood and we'll come, come to Anna. Do you feel... Um, Meskarem, that you are um, strengthening uh, civil society in Ethiopia by doing your work. How do how do you see it, or or are you providing services to people who need services, which is you know absolutely a wonderful thing? How how do you how do you see your your role and the role of your people? Yeah, so um, my role currently is like beyond ser directly providing service and I have uh, the opportunity to work with like-minded uh, organizations, be it like a youth-led organization or a women-led organization, including uh, uh, professional associations as well. Uh, I think working at Engender has, uh, has provided that opportunity like to enhance my scope to go beyond uh, our beneficiaries, like our clients, uh, to go even be, uh, beyond to address and to communicate with those people who make who make policies, those people who implement or practice policies into implementation. So uh, I think this work is uh, has given me like the opportunity to make uh, changes at different uh, levels, be it like a, at a system level, uh, uh, policy level or community level. So it's more comprehensive, like addressing issues from different perspectives. And it has provided the opportunity for me to navigate uh, within the wider sector, uh, not only like with the, within the health sector, uh, as Sekai mentioned, our programs in Ethiopia, uh, we work with the education sector. And I have this opportunity because of the programs that we lead. And we also have uh, the opportunity to work with 
with uh, the women in social affairs, uh, which helped us to address some issues which are like beyond beyond the health sector, for instance, like addressing the social norms, the perceptions and uh, attitudes towards sexual and reproductive health. Uh, so I, I say uh, we are, uh, it is like an opportunity uh, to help us address uh, SRHR from the wider scope, like be going beyond health and addressing the knowledge, the attitude, and also uh, some of the enabling environment that are needed uh, to ensure that these services are available and accessible for the communities that we are currently serving. So in, in a sense, this work on sexual and reproductive health and rights is that intersectional contribution in which you are, it's your vehicle for affecting uh, civil society in, in Ethiopia. Same question for you, Dawood. Um, do you see this as, as being um, uh, of a, of a uh, elevated um, impact beyond the actual service that is being provided in, in your communities? In your community? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a huge country. Uh, and then uh, like look, involving partners is always like you know, at our center stage. So I'll give you an example. Like recently we worked with a community radio station, uh, 15 radio, uh, community radio stations. Uh, initially, uh, they, they, their capacity uh, actually was uh, like look, they, they didn't know what is gender impact. So we worked with them uh, and then uh, uh, and then we uh, build their capacity how to integrate gender in their current program. Uh, and those are all sustainable models. Like, so these community radio stations are already working there in respective areas where we work. Even though our project closed, uh, they are still there. So when they learn uh, what is gender and how to integrate gender in other programs, uh, they will continue doing that. Similarly, other, uh, other organizations also we work with uh, and then in, in several states, because uh, I'll give you an example from the public sector. Uh, most of the our pro uh, program are at a scale, always at a scale. Uh, meaning, like, you know, if we train one community health provider, a health worker, she is working uh, at uh, like, you know, of, uh, at like she is serving 200, uh, 200 families in her respective area. So uh, our training actually benefits two hundred families in the respective area. So we work always work with the uh, and and we believe like the firmly firmly believe in uh, local capacity building. Thank you, thank you so much for the for the description, Anna. Sa same question. So I, I'll bring you back to your initial statement. Mm -hmm. you're, you're you're within a clinic, you're within a hospital, you're providing services, and now you've decided mm -hmm. to to shift. Yeah. Is it's part of this because it's it's a noble profession, right? Being a midwife, doing the work that you th that each of you three have done, it's 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 all noble. And then you decided at a certain point to shift. Was part of your reasoning for for the shift that you wanted to have a particular impact on civil society uh, writ large, uh, Anna in Tanzania, as opposed to just and it's not a just right. It's completely yeah. noble to to be yeah. working with a patient. How, yeah. how do you how do you explain your your motivation? Yeah. So, thank you, Mark. And I get that question a lot. Um, when you know in Tanzania we also have shortages of doctors, and at times people feel like you know moving from preaching to public health, you're actually making that even worse. But I also want to highlight, you know, being in the public health sector, you are doing even more. So like, you know, I'll just say, you know, in, in my scope, I work with um, Ministry of Health. You know, when we sit to develop curriculums, guidelines, you know, when you contribute to a policy. Um, so that's a bigger picture, you know, that contributes to better working environment for the doctors, for the nurses and for the clients. And I just don't work with just the Ministry of Health, you know, with different programs, we work with different ministries. So for example, I work with the Ministry of Health Minister of Social um, Welfare, um, the President's Office, Regional Authority, Local Government, Minister of Education, you know, so you get to work with a lot of ministries. So you have a bigger impact across the board, yeah? But also, you know, we also sit in different like technical working groups. 
I also see it like, you know, in the global fund, country coordinating mechanism. So, you know, you really have a bigger impact, you know, that is going to work both for the health providers, but as well as the communities. And then also in my role as a technical director, as we oversee programs, we get to visit facilities, we get to visit um, communities. So with that, again, you bring that impact to a lot more facilities, a lot more, um, you know, re um, regional level or district level uh, manage health management to improve the health system. If I was sitting in that clinic, yes, I would make an impact to a person's life, but not like, you know, in the wider um, share, but also through the programs that we implement, we also get to touch individuals. We get, we get to talk to, um, you know, different, like, you know, young people, um, old people, women, men, yeah, but also just also to mention, you know, um, uh, partnership is also another key area that we work in. So currently in Tanzania, we work with around six um, local civil society organizations. So as part of, you know, program implementation, we also share our expertise. So by being in this role and doing what I do, I also get to build capacity of those programs to keep implementing programs. So I'll just like to set an example. In one of the um, programs that we had, we worked with a youth-led organization. And one of the things that um, staff kept saying, like, you know, through this program, through this partnership, I have been able to be linked, um, and the organization also to be linked with the Ministry of Health. They can now go, they know who to talk to, they know how to navigate. They're also positioned to get more funds. So, you know, that has, that's a big impact because today, yesterday, they were not able to, you know, they were just working with the communities. Yes, it's important, but today she's also able to link with the Ministry of Health. She's also being able to link with the donors. So that's a bigger impact that will live on for a while. Yeah. If I can that's... add on to what Anna is sharing, just looking around uh, the table, the people who are speaking to you, especially focusing on the three ladies speaking to you right now, we are able to be here as leaders in our organization because SR, HR services that were extended to us allowed us and enabled us to make decisions that is benefiting our families today and has benefited our professional uh, careers. In terms of making being able to make that decision on how many kids I can have, when I can have them, it has helped specifically speaking about myself as a native of Zimbabwe, looking at myself three decades ago when I was at a place where I needed access to contraception and someone had to decide for me whether I could have access or not. If I did not have access to the contraception that I needed, I wouldn't have uh, been able to grow the professional ladder the way I did. For me to be sitting and talking to you today as Vice President of Gender Health, implementing the very services that I needed myself when I was in college and could not access because I was deemed a minor and could not access a contraception. So this is what we are trying to advocate for girls who are at a stage that we once were ourselves and we know how it felt to be denied access to services that could help you uh, achieve your goals, career goals, further education, and employment, gainful employment that could take you places. So you asked earlier on, is it making a difference? I can assure you it is making a difference and we're living testimony. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I am I, I am so floored that you have chosen to share such a important and personal story. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank you all for your work and for sharing a, a little bit about that work with us today. Sakai Chikowero, Vice President of Programs, Anna Temba, Technical Director and, and uh, country, uh, Deputy Country Representative um, for Tanzania, Dawood Alam, Senior Specialist, Social and Behavioral Change uh, and Communications in India, and Meskarem Satenya, Project Director of Sexual uh, and Reproductive Health and Rights uh, for and Gender Health in Ethiopia. Thank you so much. I, I, I truly am honored by your, uh, your patience uh, with me and, and your instruction of me and your sharing of, of your own stories with, uh, with uh, our, our community. 
Thank you. Thank you Thank for you having us. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you.